I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. The story you are about to hear is based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic, an undercover agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic, undercover agent. You can read it in the official report, the whole story of my life as a communist for the FBI. I was in the party. I saw it work. For nine years, I recorded the communist conspiracy against the United States from within. This is part of the story. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, FBI undercover agent. Here is Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, FBI undercover agent. This story from the confidential file is marked Little Red Schoolhouse. Hey! Watch where you're walking. What are you trying to do, chum? Live dangerously? I'm sorry, mister. Yeah, I'm nuts. Excuse me, buddy, but have you got a match? Sure, yeah. Thanks. Keep them. It's a red nine today. Tomorrow's red eight. Hello, Matt. It's been a long time since we've worked together. When did you get transferred from Detroit, Ed? A month ago. Oh, here comes our car. Hop back with me. Okay, Quine, take off. Let's make it fast. You know how the party checks on my time. Well, I wish we could offer you more protection, Matt, but... I know. I'm on my own. The report... A new Soviet agent has arrived from Linyan. They're going training in propaganda and infiltration. I'm one of them. And this new Soviet agent? Is going to meet with us for briefing and an assignment to some important jobs. Anything else? Meeting place is to be changed. This new Soviet agent isn't taking any chances. I don't even know his name yet. When do you meet him? Tonight, six. Better drop me off now. Mm. Any place along here. Yeah, pull it up, Gwen. Any last instructions? Yes, Matt, I want a full report by mail. Also, let me know by phone, if you can, the name of this new agent and the location of your meeting place. I'll let you know. Matt, should... Matt get in quick. Oh, uh, sure. What's up? That man, walking away from the corner. He was watching us. Who is he? Vasily Konostoy, a suspected Soviet agent. He's new here. We had him in the office for a routine check. You? Ed, that makes him the boy from Linyan Institute. Yes, very possibly. He knows I'm FBI, so you'd better start praying he didn't get a good look at you with me. If he did and he recognizes you later... Spare the details. I know what'll happen. I'm in the party, remember? Whether Ed Grayson remembered or not, I did. It was the price of my life. When six o'clock came, I was picked up and driven to a small, isolated red brick house. Inside were five people... Four men and a girl. Introductions told me the girl's name was Stephanie. And seating arrangements put us together in a corner. Close up, her dark loveliness was almost like a blow. Comrade Matt. Comrade Matthew. No, I like Comrade Matt better. Hard, tough, like you. It's a tough world, Comrade Stephanie. No room for softness. We're nothing. The party and its beliefs are everything. Do you disagree with that? (laughs) Of course not, Comrade Matt. It's only that being near you makes me feel like a woman. Is that so terrible? That's dangerous talk. I'd be more careful. I'm always careful. We'll talk more later. Comrades, I am Vasily Konistov. I bring you greetings from Comrade Stein. He thanks you for your loyal work. 
But he also desires more work, more sacrifice, especially from you, picked comrades. You are to lead the way to revolution, the Soviet state of America. While I listened, I carefully surveyed the room, the people, until I knew I would remember every detail. Vasily Kornistoy was a big man, 6'1", maybe 2", weighed around 200. Black-haired with eyes that forgot to smile when he did. Those eyes stabbed me, and I knew Kornistoy's memory was at work. When the meeting was over, he kept me for a private talk. Something to drink? No, thanks. Uh, my throat was dry. I have had the feeling all evening that we have met before, Comrade Svetik. Not that I can recall. Well, no matter. I'll remember sometime. I always do. You have a way home? Well, there's a cab stand only a mile from here. It's a nice walk. Very well. Good night, Comrade. Good night. Comrade Matt, over here. Oh, it's you, Comrade Stephanie. Oh, this is my car. Would you ride into town with me? Oh, thanks. You drive. Nice car. Nice girl. Nice night. Quite a combination. I'm glad you like it. Oh, I didn't say I liked it. I said it was quite a combination. <laughs> You are a heel, aren't you? Then I suppose I have been pretty obvious. You have? Wow. That's some curve. Now, with a drop-off of a hundred feet, if you ever went over that embankment, it would be curtains. You should go slower. So should you. You needn't be rude, Matt. It says that you're the first man in a long time I've been attracted to. Matt. All right, all right, comrade Matt. I know it's heresy for a party member to have feelings. I was hoping you might understand. Now, take it easy, Stephanie. You're tired. You're saying things that could get you into trouble. Yeah, I guess I am tired. May I put my head on your shoulder? Sure. Thanks. Oh, that's a nice feeling. Your shoulder's strong. What I said about the combination, I mean. The car and the night and me. Oh, I like it. Do you? Excuse me. Why did you turn off the ignition? Park for a moment. Why? This is why. When I got to my hotel, dawn was breaking. Before I went to sleep, however, I made a call to a certain number and left a message for Ed Grayson to meet me that morning with a wiring crew. Five hours sleep, then I was in a clump of woods near the little red schoolhouse listening to Ed give orders to a half dozen men loaded with wiring equipment. All right, men. Frederick's checked the house gas meter. No one's there now, but that doesn't mean they won't come back at any time. So do your work fast and do it good. Now get moving. The mics better be well hidden, Ed. Kind of story sharp. And suspicious. Yeah, he'd have to tear down the walls to find these. Did he recognize you? Yes, but he can't remember where yet. Hmm. How long is he going to be here? I don't know. Long enough to give us a briefing and our assignments. Yeah, we've got a lot of tape recording. We won't miss a thing that happens. Good. I'll walk down now and grab a taxi and return to the house in the open. That way I'll be there to warn your men if Conestoy or the others show up. Yeah, smart idea. When will the wiring job be finished? Oh, six, five if it goes fast. That's running it pretty close. Meeting starts at 6.30. Yeah, we'll do the best we can. I returned later, and for the next four and a half hours, I played watchdog on the front porch of the Red House. From inside, I could hear the sounds of Grayson's men at work. At 5.42, the FBI men reported their job finished. They were packing up their equipment to leave by the back door when around the curve I saw Conestoy's car approaching. Beat it, you guys. Flash red, flash red. Good 
Well, Comrade Svechik. What are you doing here so early? I, I thought I'd like to talk to you, Comrade Conestoy. Oh? Let's go inside. Oh, wait. What? I mean, it's uh, so nice out here. Why don't we just stay on the porch? I can talk here. Crazy, we could be spotted out here, inside. Oh, but Comrade... You'd you... better keep it in mind that I give the orders. Well, I, I guess being inside is not so bad, after all. What's the matter with you? You look as if you expected to see something. What is it? I merely wanted to be sure we were alone. I have a report to make about one of our comrades. Oh, is that so? Which one? Comrade Stephanie. She she shows definite signs of bourgeois emotionalism. Oh, I see. Then you had better watch her. Keep me informed. I will. <laughs> you really are a fanatic, aren't you, Comrade Svetik? I believe and follow the party line. Oh, don't mistake me. We need a few good fanatics. Uh, I wish I could remember where I have seen you before haunts me as if it's important that I should remember. The next few days were a growing fever of tension for me. The briefing was hard and thorough. I had little time to do anything but study, and this was complicated by constant invitations to study with Comrade Stephanie. And always hanging over my head was the threat of Conestoy's possible remembrance of seeing me with an FBI man. Finally, the last day of the week rolled round. Tonight, comrades, you receive your assignments. You have been well trained. Now you will act on that training. We will organize infiltration of schools? That is correct. You, comrades, Svetik, receive a choice plan. Do you know Bryson University? Yes, small college not far north of here. Though small, Bryson is a highly respected school. An example to many other colleges. You and Comrade Stephanie will see that the seeds of communism are planted there. We will not fail, Comrade Conestoy. I'm sure you won't. Comrade Svetik, about where I have seen you. Perhaps you were around my hotel for some reason? Mm, no. No. Well, don't worry. Maybe by the time you finish your assignment, I will remember. Back to Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Savetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. How long, how long did I have before the Soviet agent, Konestoy, remembered seeing me with an FBI man? The knowledge of what would happen when he did was a cold, leaden ball in my stomach. As with Comrade Stephanie, I listened to Conestoy's final instructions on our new assignment to infiltrate Bryson University. There is one professor at Bryson who will be your best asset, Comrade Svetik. A Professor Walden. Is he a fellow traveler? A very reluctant one. You will have to play down everything except how communism will save the oppressed from the tyranny of fascism. Walden is fond of helping underdogs. Well, uh, can you get us a big name, Comrade Conestoy, someone to lecture the students? I will send a wire tonight to Philip Stanley. The singer? Yes. He has a big reputation. The kids will listen to him even if he is a pinko chump. Will he come? He'll come. He's a thoroughgoing exhibitionist. Now, here is some expense money. Comrade Stephanie? Yes? I'm sending you with Comrade Svetik for only one reason so you can have the opportunity to get your thinking straight by watching his. Well, I don't... I don't understand you. He is an exemplary party worker. If you are wise, when you come back, you will be too. That's all. Good night. Good night, Comrade Conestoy. Good night, Comrade. Oh, Comrade Svetik. Yes? I just remembered where I saw you. Where? 
At the meeting of the control commission, the first day I arrived back here from the Lenin Institute. Oh, no, I, I wasn't at that meeting. <laughs> oh, I swear I had better remember it soon or it will be the death of me. Bryson University. The usual ivied buildings and rolling green campus littered with students. Professor Walden turned out to be a thin, white-haired man with bent, iron-rimmed spectacles. His office was a six-foot square of stale air wrapped around a battered desk and a stack of papers. Yeah, your coming to see me like this has posed quite a moral problem, Mr. Sovetic. Yes, indeed, uh, quite a problem. You see... I am not sure I am in complete sympathy with communist teachings. Oh, of course, but we're not here to ask you to become a communist, Professor. We merely ask you to work with us in bringing relief to the unfortunates of the world. Oh? Well, in that case, I... What can I do to help? Two things. Give us a list of students you believe to be in sympathy with our cause. And the others? We're going to organize a, a lecture. Philip Stanley, the famous singer, is flying all the way out here to address the students. It would be nice if you could act as master of ceremonies and introduce him. Oh, why, of course. I'll be delighted. Philip Stanley, indeed. <laughs> Professor Walden gave us a list of a dozen names, and we went right to work on it. Heading the list was a boy named Roger Vanning. We found him in the student union, a hodgepodge of noise and smoke which figures as the social center of any college. My goodness, Matt, this is like Mardi Gras. We'll never find him in all this mess. Sure we will, but keep moving or you'll be crushed. Uh, wow! Hey, fellas, get a load of this one. She's real great all the way. Looks like you've made a hit, Stephanie. Ask him if he knows Vanning. All right. Uh, hey, excuse me, but do you know where I can find Roger Vanning? Yeah, you understand. Oh. Well, why not take a seat here, Dolly? For you, I'd go on the hook. That'll do, Junior. Don't tense, Dad. I ain't cruising for bruising. Come on, Stephanie. That Roger Vanning looks like a kid who can vote. We'd better handle him alone. I'll try the next one on our list, uh, Grace Sprocket. Meet you out front later. So you see, Miss Sprocket, it's up to the intelligentsia, like yourself, to lead the others. I understand perfectly, Mr. Sovetic. And I can promise you at least 20 students for the meeting. Good. Philip Stanley will know of your work, I can assure you. He will? I mean, of course, that I'm naturally quite pleased to be connected with Mr. Stanley in such a worthy cause. You may tell him he can depend upon Grace Sprocket. Sure, I'll tell him. Four days of work and we had nearly 200 students lined up for our demonstration. I hired a hall near the campus, decorated it with the usual banners and slogans. During last-minute preparations, my mind was on Conestoy. Would he have remembered yet? Perhaps he had, and even now the goon squad was on its way. Oh, oh, me, 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 me. Oh, these are terrible acoustics, Vedic. Perfectly awful. Really shouldn't sing at all in a barn like this. After all, you know, these boys and girls are my public. They deserve to hear me at my best. No, absolutely, Mr. Stanley. However, just being able to see you in person and hear your words of truth will inspire these young people to magnificent heights. They'll recognize you as something far greater than a singing star. Greater than a star? Of course. You'll be known as a social leader, a man destined to sway multitudes toward the goal of true socialistic society. Well, I hadn't thought of it that way. Uh, excuse me, Svetik. I think I'll go run over this speech you prepared for me. Mm, better practice it, knucklehead. I hope I can keep my dinner when I hear it. Oh, Matt, come here a minute, would you? Sure. What is it, Stephanie? Well, I just wanted to check plans with you. Okay. After his song, Stanley will give his talk. And at the end, when he starts the Internationale, you give Grace Sprocket and the other agitators the signal to jump up and begin a community sing out of it. And when the crowd's good and excited, Sprocket and company lead them off for a demonstration on faculty row, right? Mm -hmm. And be sure the placards and signs are ready for them to pick up on the way out. Come on, let's get this thing rolling. Ladies and gentlemen of Bryson, this evening marks the beginning of a new movement here in Bryson. 
A movement that will excite you as it has excited me. Tonight, we are striking a blow against the pressure... Oh, my beloved friend, here at Bryson, I want to thank you for your wonderful reception of my humble talent and words. In closing this meeting, I can only think of the words of a song dear to my heart and dear to the hearts of all who have compassion for the more unfortunate of this earth. Sing it with me. The words are on the sheets of paper you found in your seats. That's it. The International. Sing it with me. Arise, ye victims of privation. Rise up, all ye who are for law. Everything went off like clockwork. Excited by the speeches and music, and led by the screaming Grace Sprocket and her cohorts, the thoughtless kids eagerly snatched up the waiting placards and signs to start the demonstration on the campus. For an hour, Stephanie and I watched from the background as the shouting, chanting students paraded on faculty row. Not a very pretty sight, Matt. Are you crazy? It's exactly what we wanted. There'll be a riot for sure. Right. That's why I called him. Come on, Stephanie. Our work here is done. Here we are, Stephanie. Back at the little red schoolhouse. Come on. Connor Stork's waiting for us. Let him wait for a minute. I'm sick of it, Matt. I'm sick of the rottenness of the lying and cheating... Let's quit the party, you and I. We could go away together. What? You must be out of your stupid mind talking to me this way. What are you you going to do? What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to report you. The party has ways of dealing with treason. Oh, no, no, please don't turn me in that. I'm sorry. It's too late. Get inside. I heard the report on the radio. You did a good job, comrade. What's the trouble? You look angry. I am angry. This traitor just tried to make me quit the party. Oh, did she? (laughs) I told you, Comrade Stephanie. Comrade Stretik is as solid as the Kremlin. He sure is. Wait. Wait a minute. You mean I was just being tested? Testing high-ranking party members is my job, Comrade Stretik. I'm an agent of the MVD. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll have to get back to town and file my report. Tested. After all my years in the party. Happens to all of us. Oh, oh, yes. I have something for you. A reward. Here in this drawer. Reward? This. Put up your hands. A gun? What's this all about? I don't understand. FBI agent. That's where I saw you. You were talking to an FBI man. I told you I would remember. Oh, now, now look, I, I can explain that. Get this fellow just... my car, you dirty stool pigeon. Move! What do you plan to do? Do you mind telling me? <laughs> yes, I will be glad to. I want you to have time to be afraid. We are going to arrange a little suicide. Your suicide. <laughs> My only hope was the FBI surveillance. Conestoy and I were at his car when the FBI men moved in on the run, Ed Grayson leading. Conestoy opened the car door just as Grayson squeezed a shot over our head. Down, Matt, down! I hit the dirt in that precious second when Conestoy's attention was distracted by Grayson. Then Conestoy made his break. Stop! Conestoy, stop! All right, man, get him! FBI fire laced the night with red as it went over me, but Conestoy had a good start. He was getting away when he hit that bad curve, doing 70. Then there was nothing on earth that could save him as his car skidded over the steep embankment. Well, 
No use calling an ambulance. Conestoy's dead. Better clear out, fellows, and let the police handle this as an accident. I'll stick around and square it with them. See you later, Grace. It's a tough way to go. Lucky for you, though, Matt. You're free to keep on with your work. Yeah, he was the only one who knew. Well, I'd better get out of here. I think I'll walk up and take a last look at the Little Red Schoolhouse. No, it wasn't the end of a story, nor the beginning. It was just a part of the strange war I was fighting. Freedom's a good cause. It made me feel contented, even though I knew that until the war was won, I'd always be a man who walked alone. Our star, Dana Andrews, will return in a moment. This is Dana Andrews. These stories we bring you are not fiction. They are dramatizations based on actual events and happenings that took place here, in this country, in the real-life experiences of Matt Svetik. For obvious reasons, all names, dates, and localities have been changed. Next week, we'll dramatize another exciting adventure from Matt Svetik's official records. We hope you will join us. <laughs> 